Just as theatre management at the time was modelled on the British mode, so too were the theatre buildings. The model 18th century auditorium was divided into boxes, pit, lower gallery and upper gallery with a hierarchy of prices to match. In the major London theatres, Covent Garden and Drury Lane, the side boxes were for aristocrats, affluent gentry, rich merchants and their families. The front boxes for less affluent gentry and merchants. The pit was a little more heterogeneous, though particularly associated with slightly marginal groups who could still claim social standing by virtue of profession, cultural capital or birth, i.e. lower ranking military officers, inns of court men, the literati, the lesser gentry and moderately affluent merchants. This left the two galleries. The lower of these was usually generalised as the habitation of tradesmen and their wives, while the upper gallery was seen as the haunt of a diverse group of lesser mortals, such as apprentices, sailors, labourers and domestic servants. By the 1830s, the colony at Hobart had grown beyond its original colonial and military purposes and was becoming a thriving port city, a Pacific base for the Royal Navy and the whaling and sealing industries. By the 29th of May in 1834, Henry Melville's play, The Bushrangers or Norwood Vale, officially becomes the first Australian play written on Australian soil, performed on an Australian stage, provided you don't admit the possibility of Jenny King writing performance texts for the Emu Plains convicts in the 1820s. Melville's play is performed at the Argyle Assembly Rooms in Hobart. The Assembly Rooms was leased by actor managers such as Samson and Cordelia Cameron, John Meredith and J.P. Dean. In Dean's company, the young Anne Clark made her debut on the Australian stage in 1834. Clark would go on to become the first woman to manage a theatre in Australia when she takes over the Theatre Royal in Hobart in 1840. This was the same year that a drunken stable hand in Sydney would knock over a candle in the hayloft of Levy's Royal Hotel and burn it to the ground, taking the theatre along with it. There's a surprising amount of theatres being burnt to the ground in Australian theatre history. If one was so inclined, one might be tempted to see a metaphorical resonance. Anne Clark arrived in Hobart with Dinah Rudelhoff to perform in The Lord of the Manor with the Cameron Company. Rudelhoff would go on to be the director of the Geelong Theatre in 1845. Clark is a bit of a mystery. At the time, she was described as having been a performer in London, possibly with the Lyceum, but little is known of her early life or can be found to corroborate her British career. Her Australian debut, however, is described in detail by the reviewers. The scenic effects receive little or no attention at the theatre. The side scenes are seldom changed so that for a cottage scene we have the first three sides of a marble hall and the next of a forest side. The finale of The Lord of the Manor took place in a jail instead of a commodious room in a mansion. It is these trifling things which will ever spoil the best pieces, let the acting be ever so good. As to the manner in which the pieces are got up, we shall hereafter say a few words, but so imperfectly do the actors learn their parts that it is no uncommon thing for some of them to come to a dead standstill and wait until such time as memory comes to their aid. But we've all been in that kind of show, and some of us have been responsible for them. Anne Clark became director of the Theatre Royal in 1840. As director, she recruited actors from England as a way to improve the professional standard of the local theatre community. She produced grand opera three times a week, tragedies twice a week, and burlesques on a Sunday. Their company broke up in 1845, and she retired in 1847, and there's little recorded of her life after that. At this time, the global touring network of actor-manager companies was reaching out to include the southern half of the globe. In this way, American and English touring shows would connect with New Zealand, Australia and South Africa, hiring the theatres that had first been built by the Levies and the Wyatts before them. One such legendary theatre builder in Melbourne was George Coppin. Coppin was a comedy actor born and trained in England. He came to Australia in 1843 and joined in with Joseph Wyatt, yes, that Joseph Wyatt, at the Royal Victoria Theatre. Coppin made a career of wild swings between success and failure, regularly producing theatrical hits and making a fortune, then investing that fortune poorly in crazy schemes, from the Cremorne Pleasure Gardens to the first skating rink and the first balloon ascent in Australia, and losing it all, only to return to theatre and make it all back again. In January 1845, he made his Australian acting debut in Hobart for Anne Riemann's Clark, who then complained that when he left to set up a theatre in Launceston, he took all her best actors with him. By June that year anyway, he'd moved that company to the Queen's Theatre in Melbourne and then back and forth between Melbourne, Adelaide and Geelong, partnering with, taking over and abandoning theatres as he went. After an insolvency in 1851, he moved to the Goldfields, playing his best comedy roles to minors in tents, then returned to taking over theatres in Geelong and Adelaide for a while before going back to London for three years. In 1854, he returned to Melbourne with a prefabricated iron building that he plonked on Exhibition Street and opened as the Royal Olympic Theatre in 1855. Though most people just called it the Iron Pot. There he played his favourite comic roles alongside his friend and business partner, the well-known English tragedian G.B. Brooke.
Coppin was constantly retiring from the theatre, only to make triumphant returns when he needed the money. He was elected to the Richmond City Council and the Victorian Legislative Assembly. He built the Haymarket Theatre after falling out, then back in with Brooke. He became manager of the Theatre Royal in Melbourne after a political defeat, raised the capital to build a new Theatre Royal and engaged the American double act, J.C. Williamson and Maggie Moore, to open it. He then went back to his political career, was involved with setting up the St John's Ambulance in Victoria, then back to theatre management in the 1880s, producing pantomimes with Bland Holt. At the height of its activity, the actor-manager era was characterised by producers such as Coppin and companies such as the Bruff Bosico Company and the Bland Holt Popular Dramatics Company. The Bruff Bosico Comedy Company debuted in Sydney in 1886, founded by Robert Bruff and Dion Bosico Jr. Bosico Jr., more commonly known as Dot, was the son of world-renowned Irish actor and writer Dion Bosico. Bosico Jr. and his sister, Nina, were outraged by their father's sudden bigamous marriage in Sydney on that tour, and they opted to remain in Australia rather than continuing the tour with him. When they left the company, J.C. Williamson offered Dot a job, managing a tour by English actor Robert Bruff, who had come to Australia in 1885 to present the premiere performance of the Olympi for J.C. Williamson. The Bruff Bosico Comedy Company strove to present elegant society comedies and serious dramas by writers such as J.M. Barry, Pinero, and Oscar Wilde. They avoided popular melodramas, set high admission prices to keep out the riffraff, and worked in smaller and more intimate theatres in the cities such as the Bijou in Melbourne and the Criterion in Sydney. Bosico supervised the productions in the manner of a modern director, and the company's attention to subtlety and natural ensemble acting drew them the approbation of the local intelligentsia and culturati. Bruff and Bosico often prepared shows without performing in them and are sometimes credited with the introduction of the role of the non-acting artistic director to Australia. In 1889, the Bijou burnt down, taking a lot of the company's props, costumes and set along with it. They recovered slowly from the financial losses of the fire, but by 1895, after struggling to get Australian audiences to like Oscar Wilde, Dot decided to return to London. Bland Holt, on the other hand, was a local actor manager more in the George Coppin mould and was supported by the Coppin family. Lucy Coppin worked with Holt's company as property mistress and sometime performer. The Bland Holt Popular Dramatic Company regularly produced texts from popular English writers such as Henry Pettit and Sutton Vane. Holt worked with a regular company of actors including Walter E. Baker, Brighty Smith, Harry Ireland, Charles Brown, Francis Ross, Myra Kemble, August Glover and Holt's wife Florence Anderson who performed as Mrs. Bland Holt. Their work toured Sydney and Melbourne, predominantly playing in the Theatre Royals in those cities and was regularly accompanied by the scenic painting of John Brunton. Holt shows were known for their massive spectacle, including having a live horse race on stage with no less than five horses, a live bicycle race, a pool, casts of over a hundred performers, and lavishly designed tableaus. The Bland Holt Popular Dramatic Company, a touring pantomime and melodrama operation, are a good contrast to the Bruff Bosico Comedy Company. While the Bruff Bosico Company were known for their emphasis on social critique and realism and were the favourite of the middle class of the city, the Bland Holt Popular Dramatic Company specialised in grand spectacle and attracted arguably a more diverse and working class audience. Together they might be considered the first instance of the balance maintained in Melbourne between a larger alternative company and a larger mainstream company, a balance which is still with us today. During this era, the professional Australian entertainment and cultural industries began to exploit the performance traditions of the First Nations people. Shamefully, Indigenous people were regularly displayed as anthropological curiosities at fairs and circuses. It was not uncommon for producers to round up Indigenous people and take them to the city to perform corroboree and other ceremonies for paying audiences. Jacob Bohm shared with us the story of the Cape York men in the early 1800s who were chained together and marched to the city to perform local culture for white audiences. A note in the Perth Gazette of 1833 reveals the dual nature of this kind of colonial soft power, describing a corroboree performed by the Swan River and the King George River tribes in WA, the Noongar and Kimberley people. Present at the performance were local city dignitaries, as well as Yigan, a respected Indigenous elder who was acting as master of ceremonies. Only a few weeks later, Yigan would be declared an outlaw, captured, shot and beheaded. It's also worth noting that during this period there was a flourishing Chinese opera circuit on the goldfields of Victoria. The population of Chinese diggers on the goldfields during the gold rush was in the tens of thousands, and between 10 and 30 travelling Chinese opera companies were licensed to tour the diggings. These included the Chin Ah Tip Company, Lo Chong and Hap Pen Choi's Company, and Li Ji's Company. They would set up outside of town in the Chinese encampments and present classics from the Chinese operatic canon. Of course, they attracted complaints in the papers from European settlers and miners, and they're described by one European visitor, the place is crowded from half past seven o'clock till one in the morning, the acting continuing without intermission the whole time. 
The dresses are certainly very valuable and gorgeous, and the tragedies nightly performed seem powerful to influence the audience. The cutting off of some caitiff's head represented by the aid of a milliner's block and the suicide by hanging of a despairing princess on a butcher's meat hook form the sensational scenes. These scenes are responded to with the most encouraging demonstrations on the part of the audience. By the 1900s and the beginning of the new century, a change in the landscape of professional performance and entertainment was underway. While the actor-manager companies would continue on as smaller independent commercial entities, one company amongst them had already begun to evolve into something new, something big. The transformation of American actor manager James Cassius Williamson's touring company into the nation straddling behemoth, colloquially known only as the firm, would mark the transition from the era of the actor manager into the era of the National Commercial Theatre Company, which we'll look at next episode. Theatre was and is an important tool for the process of colonization. The telling of the colonizer's story as a way to maintain group identity becomes even more important in occupied territory. Familiar cultural touchstones such as Shakespeare or Sheridan help to reassure the colonizers that where they are does not matter so much as who they are. So long as that has not changed, they feel secure. Of course, this isn't just the job of the theater. Canonical works of literature, fine art, history, law, and religion all function the same way to assert and maintain the centrality of the colonizer's culture. In time, this impulse will work to exclude the cultural differences of new additions to the colony and also to erase the culture of the colonized. But what do you think? Leave your thoughts and your questions in the comments section below. Next month, JC Williamson and The Firm.